Today is Tuesday, July 26, 2011, and we're interviewing Mr. Thomas Sutton at the Fairhope Public Library. Mr. Sutton was born on July 2, 1923 in Mobile, Alabama, and is currently 88 years old. My name is Cecil Christenberry, and I'm very honored to have the opportunity to visit with Mr. Sutton today. We've got a full crew here, camera of people and all that, and we appreciate their service. Mr. Sutton, it is indeed an honor to be here with you this morning. Thank you very Thank much you. for taking your time to come for this most important project that, uh, that we're doing here today. So uh, you were born in Mobile. Did you grow up there? I was born in Mobile and raised in Mobile. All right, and that was in 1923, so you've seen a lot of changes. I saw a lot of changes. Uh, I lived through the Depression, and I was fortunate enough to be the bat boy for the Mobile Shippers in the Southeastern League, Class B Baseball. And because of that, I got to know a lot of the citizens of Mobile, and after all that many years, uh, I'm addressed by some of the people, older people, that uh, they have read something the bad boy. My goodness. Well, so other than an extended uh, several years in the military, have you been in Mobile all your life? I have. Uh, after coming out of the service um, on the GI Bill, I went to Auburn University, which was known at that time as Alabama Polytechnic Institute, and I graduated in um, 48 from the School of Engineering. Oh, well, I, I noticed that uh, having grown up in Mobile and you were, you were a young man, young young boy actually, during the Depression years, what did your parents do? What were their occupation? Um, at that time, my father uh, was a boiler maker at the Alabama shipyard, Alabama dry docks. He also was a veteran of World War One. so uh, and my great-great-grandfather was a corporal in the Confederate Cavalry. So I do have a little bit of background of um, military. What about brothers and sisters? Have any siblings? I had one brother, uh, and he served in the, uh, in the U.S. Army. And, and no sisters? No sisters. Uh, well, in about 1942, you must have been 19 years old. Right. Go back, if you would. What What were you doing in 1942 as a young man in Mobile, Alabama? Uh, the day that the bomb was dropped, I, along with two or three of my friends, were actually what the uh, the present generation would say they were, were cruising. So we were cruising in Fairhope, driving down the beach and towards the wharf and enjoying the scenery. And uh, th that's the first time that we heard that uh, Pearl Harbor had been, had been bombed. That was, that was on that infamous Sunday. Right. Y'all were cruising on, on, the, on the beach. That was, and, cruising and it, on the beach. <laughs> so, oh, Mr. Sutton, did that, you decided at that point that you would enlist in the military service? I did. Um, being, I was a senior at Murphy High School and really hadn't made any plans to what I was going to do after I graduated. But immediately, immediately, learning of the sneak bombing of Pearl Harbor, I decided then that I would enlist. How did you choose which branch of the service that you wanted to serve in? 
that is an interesting story. Uh, one reason I enlisted is because I wanted to be in the Air Force. And the recruiters, uh, they have, have a quota of how many they're supposed to recruit. And they're not always truthful. But they promised me that uh, I would be in the Air Force. And when I was in basic training in Kearns, Utah, which is uh, close to Salt Lake City, I found out that I was not going to be in the Air Force, that I was going to be uh, sent to school to be some sort of a technician in the, one of the hospitals. And that was a real disappointment. And there was two other uh, boys that had been made the same promise. One of them was from Mobile, and another one was from Waker, Alabama. So we decided that we would see what we could do about it. And so uh, the temperature was around zero, and we walked about a mile to talk to the commanding officer. And we were able to get a uh, conference with him, and we told him what had happened. And he said, I'll see what I can do about it. The next day or two, we found out that we would be in the Air Force, and we would be in sh on shipping orders to leave out soon. So at first, that was a real disappointment. And not knowing any better, we just went in to see the commanding officer, and uh, he gave us an audience, and <clears throat> he made the decision. Well, your tenacity showed from the very beginning of your career. I wondered how hard was it to adjust from life at Murphy High School in Mobile, Alabama, to basic training in Utah? It wasn't easy. Um, one thing that was real different about it, the, vet, the soldiers there from, were from various places in the United States. And it was a few of us from the South. And you could tell which ones were from the South because we were dressed in denim fatigues and a denim flop-eared hat. And all the rest of them that, that came from other places in the United States were dressed in uh, olive green, olive drab. So you look out on the parade field, you see a half a dozen with the blue denim clothes on, they were from the South. That's extremely interesting. I know I, I never knew that they segregated like that. So well, you... <laughs> uh, I don't know if it was intentional or, or what, but uh, it had its advantages and disadvantages. When someone wanted someone for a detail, like KP, it was very easy to see someone dressed in blue, blue denims, and say, I want you. Well, that just doesn't seem quite fair, <laughs> Mr. Sutton, but, but you withstood and, and you handled that, did you not? I, I did. You did. <laughs> well, the question then, you go, you and your buddies uh, from Alabama go to the CO and you request a, a change that you're disappointed that you, uh, where, where did he ship you? When you got your orders, where did you end up for basic training? At, the, at that time, I was at Kearns, Utah, right out from uh, Salt Lake City. 
and for my uh, training for the Air Force, I went to Wichita Falls, Shepherd Field, and Texas. And it was one of, it was cold in the winter, and it was hot in the uh, dust in the summer. So we had quite an adjustment to make. We went to school five days a week, all day, uh, learning the components of the airplane and also doing some uh, extensive basic training. We were really on a fast course to get us, get us trained. So I've naturally thought on several occasions, well, I could be in that hospital very comfortable, but here I am out here uh, training to go overseas to be shot at. Well, question, did they require you to wear, you Alabama boys, to wear denim in Texas? No. <laughs> uh, uh, well, we did wear until we were issued new clothes. And actually, we just had about two changes of clothes. That was it. So you were, you found yourself in basic training in Texas in the Air Force. In the Air Force. In the Air Force. And that, that made you, that fulfilled you. That made That's you what, happy. Well, that made me happy. And, uh, I wanted to get into the action. Uh, I thought the United States was uh, strong. I knew we were. And I thought it'd be just a short time before we'd win the war. How long were you in basic training in Texas? It was probably three months. And from there, my next uh, assignment was at Tenderfield, Florida, and that was for aerial gunnery school. And we actually started out shooting a BB gun, sort of like at the, the fair when you have the ducks uh, walking past and you shoot the, shoot the gun. Well, we were start out with BP guns. The next thing we were uh, shooting skeet with a shotgun in a uh, stationary position. And after that, we was put on the back end of a pickup truck, driving through the woods, waiting for uh, an object to fly out in front of us and shoot it on the, on the run. And uh, I know on one occasion the instructor said, when you turn, when we make this turn, you better be careful because that duck's going to come right to you. And if you don't shoot, it's just going to hit you. So. Uh, that was uh, quite an ex exciting uh, part of the training. Well, let me ask you this. As a city boy from Mobile, had you ever shot a gun before? If I had, it was uh, probably out in the backyard. Yeah. I, I had, was not used, used to a gun. The next part of that training um, we was in an open cockpit, 86, and in front of us was another plane that was drawing, pulling us a big silk uh, target. And our ammunition, each one's ammunition, on the tip of it was painted. 
so uh, after the flight, they could take down the target and count how many times you hit. Because if your uh, projectors were red, well then they count them and that's how many you hit. Somebody else may have blue. And of course I, I was always uh, a little bit afraid that might hit the airplane that was pulling the target. But you never did, right? Never did. <laughs> and he appreciates that as well. <laughs> well, okay, you've been through basic training and you've moved a couple of times. You're in Tyndall, at Tyndall Air Force Base. When did you get your orders to for the next part of your service? Well, well after I finished at uh, Tyndall Field, I was sent to um, Columbia Army Air Base in uh, South Carolina. And there it, uh, we uh, were assigned to a crew that we would fly with, be a tail gunner, radio operator, engineer gunner, which was my position, pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, and navigator. And we were there for several months training, some night flying, and after that period of time, it was decided that we were ready to go in combat. So about a seven-member crew, you were a part of about a seven-member crew. We would fly anywhere from five to seven, and our particular crew was just five. And the reason for that, there'd been a, a B-25, which we were going to fly, had been modified to have a 75 millimeter cannon in the nose. And uh, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't use a, a co-pilot on that flight. And this cannon was experimental and essentially it was uh, on the plane to shoot enemy boats in the water. And it ended up that it, it wasn't practical. The cannon was too big for the plane. And when it shot, uh, you, the, you could feel it in the plane. And they modified all those that had the 75 millimeter and went back to the conventional um, machine guns. So you were actually part of an experimental situation to actually determine you know, what was feasible and what, what in the, exactly would work. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in, in that crew. That was guys that you you got very close to. Is that is that fair to say? What was that now? That was that was fellas that you became pretty tight with. You became I did. buddies. Um, I was only soldier. We had one from Rhode Island, Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut. And there's one interesting thing about that. Uh, when we, uh, right before we finished our training, we were given permission to make one flight to someone's hometown. And Luckily, I convinced them to come to Mobile to Brooklyn Field. So we flew into Br Brooklyn Field. Uh, my parents met us. Uh, we took them home from dinner, had fried chicken, uh, mashed potatoes, and banana pudding, and plenty of sweet tea. 
So they got a, a pretty good taste of Southern hospitality. So actually, me being the only Southern one on the flight, I got along fine. We never had any any disputes or anything. They didn't mind one, they didn't regret one bit coming to Mobile for what you just they, described, right? They were real, uh, real happy. And the um, um, navigator made one comment. He said, I won't have any trouble finding Mobile because I can smell the paper mill. <laughs> <laughs> what strikes me about that wonderful story is that y'all were young men from all over the United States, but y'all were all Americans willing to serve your country, yep. and that that's that's so valuable even to us today. That's right. That's wonderful, wonderful. Okay, so you you were able to make a trip home with your crew, and then you received orders to received to, uh, received received orders. We didn't know where we were going. Um, we went by bus or train or something. I don't remember exactly what we, transportation was to Savannah, Georgia. There we were put on a troop train and it took us about three days to get to San Francisco. We stayed in San Francisco about two days, and then our orders became uh, visible to us. So uh, our orders were to be in the 13th Air Force, 42nd Bomb Group, 75th Squadron, and our next destination was Guadalcanal. Um, we stopped two times before we got there. We stopped in Honolulu and Hickam Field, and we could still see a lot of the results of Pearl Harbor refueled about 10 or 12 hours later. We landed on a little island named Canton, C-A-N-T-O-N. We refueled there, and the next stop was Guadalcanal. On the, going back just a moment, uh, not to regress, but on the troop train from Savannah to San Francisco, your crew, your buddies that had been training together, y'all y'all stayed tight there, y'all kind of stayed we with did, each other? And, uh, the strange thing is, uh, uh, the soldiers were not the only ones on the train. It was also civilian passengers. Uh, we had been given our 45 automatics, and we had those strapped on. And to get to the dining hall, you'd had to walk through the other cars where the civilians were. So we got a lot of attention walking through the train with live ammunition, and uh, I don't think any of them were frightened or anything, but it, it had to have some kind of effect on them. I imagine they felt very secure mm -hmm. knowing that they were in good hands there. I can't imagine landing at Hickam Field to refuel and looking over, as you said, and, st and see some of the damage that had inspired you about a year before, maybe less than a year before. Yeah. That had to be an emotional it event. Did. And uh, an another strange thing uh, about it, uh, landing there at Hickam Field, uh, I met someone I knew that was uh, stationed there. And then when we flew to the little island of Canton, I met someone I knew there. Uh, so it, it was pretty uh, 
versatile group of people. You were halfway around the world from right. Mobile, Alabama, and right. you saw folks that you knew. Mm -hmm. That had to that had to be special. It did. That had to be good. So when you landed at Guadalcanal, that's when you started getting orders for for missions uh, that y'all, that your crew, that your your plane was to was to embark on. Well, when we got to Guadalcanal. They, at the Air Force had already decided to take the 75 millimeter out, and we didn't have a co-pilot because we didn't wasn't supposed to have one. But in as much as they modified the plane, we took on a co-pilot, and the co-pilot had never flown in a B-25. He was just uh, trained to, to fly. So we made several trips with him, training trips, to let him get the feel of the plane. A very nice fella. Well, on the second or third landing, we got to the end of the runway, and usually when you get to the end of the, end of the runway, the water's right at you. So if you kept going, you'd run into the ocean. And he made the landing all right, and he turned the plane to, to go park it. And when he did, there was a big log on the ramp to keep you from going that direction. Well, he accidentally hit it, and the B-25 has uh, three wheels like a tricycle, and he hit it with the front wheel. It collapsed, and the plane was sticking up in the air about 45 degrees. and. My response, one of my responsibilities was to uh, man the fire extinguisher in case there was a fire when something happened. So I was able to get out of the plane somehow with the fire extinguisher. The plane didn't catch on fire and everything was fine with the exception they held the pilot responsible because he was a high-ranking man for the mistake that was made. And he was devoted from a pilot to a co-pilot and taken, taken off our crew. So uh, here we were with the crew that we were trained with, the pilot we were trained with, and uh, they assigned us a, a new pilot. Then we were ready for combat. Well, let me ask you, did you keep the same co-pilot? No. Okay. We, we didn't keep the same co-pilot. Actually, the pilot that was assigned to us was a veteran pilot, and he had already flown about 30 or 40 missions, and uh, he was a very good pilot. And we got a, a, a co-pilot who was uh, a professor from the University of Florida, and he eventually became our first pilot. So the fact that you lost the pilot you had trained with I'm sure at first that might have been maybe a little bit of setback to you. It was because he was the same pilot that had flown into Mobile with us, so we were close. Yes, yes. So you've got your crew intact, the plane has been repaired, and you're ready for missions. Now, I don't know if that plane, I don't know how it was re repaired. We got another plane. You got another plane, ready to go. Mm -hmm. 
So take us back, if you would. How, you, you would have a meeting in the mornings, and they would give you orders for the day or plans for a mission? Normally, we would look at the bulletin board um, in the afternoon to determine if we're going to schedule to fly. And then we would meet the, the next morning for interrogation. They would tell us what our target was, what to expect, uh, how much anti-aircraft guns we would, would probably run into. And at that time is when we knew what we were going to do. Usually our flights, we flew in sections of 12, three, six, nine, and 12, step down. And this was more like following the leader, the lead plane. Uh, had to lead the navigator in it. And if everything went well, uh, we all went to the target and uh, all opened the bomb bay doors at the same time and dropped our bombs and then, then head back. Well, I'm sure that y'all were all eager and ready. You had been trained, well trained. You had comrades and your friends in these crews, uh, so I, I know you had to be excited in the afternoon when you you, you we saw. We were actually looking forward to it. Um, I really don't remember anyone that was real fearful. And then when we got back, actually when we started over the target, some of the planes had cameras in them. And as you'd open the bomb bay door, you would uh, open the hatch to the, to the camera. And the camera would automatically st start taking pictures. When you got back on the ground, the intelligence officers would uh, look at those pictures. And that's how they would estimate how much damage you did. And they would also be able to spot the flash of the anti-aircraft guns so they could uh, uh, have that on record. So when the next flight went up, they would know where they, where they were. Well, Mr. Sutton, on a typical mission, like you, you left out early this morning, how long typically would that take for you to do your job and get back to base? Well, actually, uh, in the Pacific, where I was, uh, our missions were fairly short because we was hitting certain islands and things. And when you looked down, all you saw was water. And some of the pilots that came, that had come over from Europe, uh, said that was more difficult because when they were flying over France and Germany, you could spot buildings as you knew. But flying in the Pacific, all you saw was water. Well, it's good to have a good navigator on there. He could get you to Mobile and he could get you to the right island, couldn't he? Um, that's good, but at this particular flight, we didn't have one. Uh, actually, it was my 29th flight, and our crew was ready to go to Australia for rest and relaxation. And one of the, the radio operator's name had already come up to go, and he postponed his so we would all go together. So it ended up none of us got to go. And 
we were on, we were flying, flying out of an airfield at the very north tip of New Guinea named Sansapur. And during our stay at Sansapur, the enemy came over occasionally at night. As a night, not necessarily did a lot of damage, but it naturally disturbed us. The air, the air alarm went off, and we looked for shelter. The plane came on over and dropped its bombs and went home. So this 29th flight was designed to give them part of their own medicine. So it was actually two flights, two planes went up at night. And part of this I didn't know until later who the other plane was. We were actually on our own. And we were told to find a target because there was a number of little islands that had airfields on them. So we were really sort of on our own. And I failed to mention, but when you start to get a fly that morning, you go by the parachute shack and pick up a parachute and also your life preserver. Well, I kept my life preserver with me all, all the time. I didn't leave it um, in the shack. And I would, the life preserver, we called it a May West. And I had mine and I would inflate it by blowing in it. And I used it for a pillow. And also the straps that go between your legs and around your waist, all of them were the same size. And uh, when I put mine on, the straps were almost down to my knee. So I'd taken my preserver and uh, part of what they gave us when we was outfitted fitted with clothes was a little sewing kit which mounted to a needle and thread. And I made, a, I rearranged the length of my life preserver. And that's the reason I didn't mix it with the others. And I knew that it had full cylinders that, uh, CO2 cylinders that would inflate it. So I was very fortunate to have my own life preserver. So this 29th flight, it was a night flight. Night flight. And at that time, you, you, you learned later there was another plane that right. night. But as far as you knew, y'all were up to find a target. Right. Do you recall the date of that flight? Uh, I do. It was August 5th, uh, 1944. We left, I think it's before dark. And I found out later this was at a squadron reunion in 2001 in Las Vegas. That's the first time I'd met any of the, the crew 
that I'd flown with um, in the squadron. And the colonel was the master of ceremony, and they had designated me as the keynote speaker. And the colonel, when he was introducing me, he says, I'm going to tell Sergeant Sutton something that he don't know. So he went on to say that the pilot that had been assigned to fly with us, it was not our regular pilot, he had a friend that was an intelligence officer, the one that uh, went to the University of uh, Florida. Uh, that wanted to, wanted to fly as an observer. So they agreed to let him fly with us, although he, he had no responsibility. But before the flight, a bee had stung the pilot, and the pilot had had a reaction from the be sting. So at the last minute, they had to get another pilot. So there were two colonels there. One was uh, above the other one in authority. And they debated who was going to take the flight. And the the one who was our squadron commander, he told the other colonel, he says, I'll take the flight because I've been flying more than you have, and uh, I feel like I can uh, take this flight better than you can. Well, they put that uh, pass that by him, but the other, the one that had the most authority, he said he would fly. So we didn't even know him, uh, and they tried to talk the intelligence officer out of going, and he said no, he wanted to go. So they did let him go. So, I may be getting ahead of your no. You're doing fine. Questions there, no, sir. But as we were flying around, we would see one island that was lit lit up pretty well. So we would fly to it, and before we got there. They had extinguished their lights, so we were looking for another target. Well, that went on for some while. We finally dropped our bombs, and we were ready to come home. Our normal flights would take about four hours from the time we left to the time we got back. Well, after flying around from one target to another, uh, we didn't know where we were. We knew the vicinity, so the operator, radio operator got on the phone and asked for everyone to get off the uh, the radio wave so he could get direct information. And it was a beautiful night. 
had um, the co-pilot normally would have uh, been able to shoot the stars and tell you exactly where you were. Well, he didn't do a very good job of it. And then the reply we got back from the, the radio operator uh, told us to take a, 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 a course of 165 degrees. And the pilot didn't think that was right. Um, he had lost confidence in the navigator. The navigator uh, had lost confidence in the pilot. So we flew around trying to find our way. And pretty soon we'd been in the air eight hours. And uh, we knew the fuel was low. So one of the islands that we had hit actually gave us a green light to land. Now, we never did know whether uh, the ground crew there thought well, we were one of them or what. but. We decided we weren't going to land on an enemy airfield. First thing, they'd have possession of the airplane and uh, have us as prisoners. So we would continue to fly. And we knew if we went completely out of gas, the plane would fall. It wouldn't have power to stay up. So the pilot decided that he would land in the ocean, what you call ditching the plane. And my responsibility, one of them, was to break the windows out of the plane and throw everything overboard that wasn't attached down, attached to the plane because of the impact at 150 miles an hour, everything that wasn't anchored was going to come forward. So I accomplished what I was supposed to do. And then I braced up against the Bombay, and the tail gunner braced up against me. The radio operator was sitting right in front of me. And in front of the Bombay is where the pilot, co pilot, and navigators are. And the plane hit the water and floated about 45 seconds. And I was able to get to the window that I'd broken out and jump out on the wing. And from there, I walked out to the end of the wing, and I got to thinking, if this plane goes down, it's going to cause a suction, and I'm going with it. So I inflated my life vest and jumped off before the plane went down. In the meantime, the radio operator had gotten the five-man life raft out of the plane, and he was uh, rowing it around to pick, pick uh, the rest of us up. I don't remember what 
order I was in that I was picked up. But anyway, two of the men didn't get out of the plane. The tail gun that was braced against me, he didn't get out. And all I can do is think that the jaw may have broken his neck or something. He was unconscious and couldn't get out. The, the navigator, he didn't get out. So we lost two. The op, uh, radio operator maneuvered the life raft around and picked us up. At that point, we had six. The life raft was made to handle five, so we were pretty crowded. And we thought that we would be picked up because we sent out the SOSs and um, we just figured that we'd be picked up. Well, after daylight, our planes came over. Uh, we had a flare gun and we shot the flare and they didn't see us. And they went on and bombed the island and went on back to base. So about that time, I was hurting real bad. And they pulled up my pants leg and saw that the tibia was sticking out of the skin about two and a half inches. And the fibula, which is a small bone, and the leg was broken also. So I was the only one that was um, seriously injured. All of them had scratches and bruises. But we floated around um, thinking a rescue plane would come or either we'd get uh, attacked from the island. Well, at that point, we decided that something needed to be done with my leg. So, paddled the life raft to the beach. And we got out of the out of the life raft, and of course I was helpless. And they were going to put try to put a splint on the leg with the bone sticking out that far, um, and no equipment. Uh, it was impossible to do, and I couldn't stand the pain anyway. But our, our bombardier went off to the right, and the intelligence officer went the opposite way, looking to see uh, if, if the mm -hmm. enemy had spotted us and were coming. So while they were trying to put the splint on the leg, the bombardier had called out to notice fires that a job patrol was coming. And the intelligence officer who had gone the other direction went to join the, the one that indicated that there were uh, a Jap patrol there. So we debated as to what we were going to do. We knew how cruel the enemy was. We'd heard about their torture. And so that was one option. 
we take our own life. And the other option was that we fight. And the enemy made that decision for us because they came rushing at us in a way with their machetes and shouts that, that they were going to kill us. And the radio operator didn't have his gun for some reason. And he asked if he could use mine. And I told him that they could get them run, and I couldn't. And he said, well, I'm going to stay with you. So I gave him the gun. About that time, the enemy was up on us. This radio operator was Italian boy from New York, and he shot and killed five Japanese right then. And then, we don't really know why, but the, um, one of the fellows that was scouting came back to us being, um, actually he had had his hands tied behind him by the Japanese and he let, us, let him right up to us. Now whether he thought that the Japanese had killed us, we have no idea. But when he got within um, shooting range, Nick the bar from um, Syracuse, New York, he pulled the trigger and he was out of ammunition. But he was close enough to hit him with the gun and knocked him down and he got up and ran. Now the other intelligence officer that was scouting, that's the last we ever saw of him. We don't know if uh, the Japanese killed him, uh, whether he was going to try and survive in the jungle. And we knew we had to get off the island. So I had picked up an oar and was going to use it as a crutch. And as soon as I picked it up and tried to get up, I fell flat, flat on my face. So the men picked me up and put me in a life raft. And what few supplies we had, we got away in such a hurry, we left them. You know, like your uh, ration kit and uh, medical kit. So the tide was coming in so fast as we would gain two yards, the tide would bring us back two or three yards. So it took us, looked like forever, to get out of the breakers. Just, just like the breakers at Gulf Shores, you know, how they start coming in. So we finally got out of the breakers. We stayed the rest of that day and the next night, and we decided something had to be done. Uh, I was thinking about gangrene in the leg, and we were trying to determine whether um, it'd be better to go ashore and see what could be done than to stay out in the raft waiting to be picked up. 
Well, we decided to go back to the island, but we're about five miles from the original spot. And at that time, the tide was going out. So, uh, and the life raft was deflating. So all of them got out of the life raft except me. And they held on to it and pushed along until we got ashore. Well, there again, this decision was made for us that we couldn't take the life raft back out because it was deflated. We didn't have any way to pump it up. So they tried to hide the raft as best they could. And we stayed there that night. And I was delirious part of that time. And the next morning, they decided to, we decided to move off the beach into the island. And two of the men put their arms together and made a basket like to carry me. And they picked me up and we went in maybe a hundred yards. And during that time, a vine or something would catch hold of that broken leg and it would uh, twist it around and I'd be under a lot of pain. We found a stop, a place to stop. And actually there was a, a trail that had been used by either animals or uh, Japanese soldiers or something. So we stopped there and I suggested that we get off the trail, which we did, and got behind some trees. Well, two of the men went looking for water and they had a, a rubber collapsible bucket and they hadn't been gone too long when two Japanese passed by on the trail. They didn't see us and we didn't uh, try to attack them. They went on their way. After it seems like several hours, the men came back and had found water and they had a little bit in the bucket. So each one of us took a swallow of water and then we moved again to the place where they found the water. And that's where we stayed. We, uh, there were coconuts growing and that's what we had to eat. But if you would ever try and get the um, the husk off of a coconut, it's a pretty good job. But anyway, that's what we ate. And on the eighth day, our, some of our men had been going to the beach every day trying to signal our planes. And on the eighth day, they spotted us. And they spent them, sent a PPY flying boat to pick us up. And he missed us. And by that time it was dark. So the next morning, the flying boat came back and had a escort of fighter planes. They made a smoke screen and 
sort of raft in to pick us up. So we all got aboard the PBY, and then we were really frightened then because we knew that we'd given our position away. We were just waiting to be picked off the water. So the flying boat tried to take off. The waves were rough and it didn't seem to be able to get an altitude. So they overflowed a hundred so gallons of fuel to lighten the plane and we took off. And they landed at a little island named Biak. It's right on the equator. And they left me there because it was a little field hospital. And the plane went on back to, to our base. And that's the last time I saw any of them but one. One time, uh, one man, and I saw him on two different occasions after that. Well, they uh, cleaned the leg up and they found that maggots had got into it, which I knew they had because you could feel that. And the men that was with us had taken off their undershirts and used that for a bandage around my leg. Well, anyway, they cleaned it up and they said, actually, the maggots had eaten the infection and, and kept it clean. Then I was sent to what they call a, a general hospital. Looked like a long chicken coop. And uh, there I stayed for about two months. They put me in traction to draw the bones together. And um, late in December, or maybe middle of December, they d decided to send me home. And I had a cast on, and I actually hadn't been up uh, with the cast for a time or two, and I was really too weak to walk. But they put me in an ambulance and took me to Port Morrisby, where there's the, the ships came in. And I was in this ambulance for a couple of hours waiting. They finally got me out of the ambulance on a wire stretcher and, and took it to, to this boat up to the dock. And after a time, the operator on the the crane dropped a cable down, picked the stretcher up, brought it over to the deck of the ship, and placed it there. And I was taken down into number four hole on the cargo ship to come back to the States. It was took 21 days and I got to back to the States on um, January the 8th, where I'd gone down on October the 6th. So that's the length of time between then. And 
I was sent to Harmon General Hospital in Longview, Texas. They took the cast off and found that the bone had never starred the men. They scraped the bone clean, clipped off the dead ends, and put a pin in it, or a screw. And I stayed there until September. I was in January to September, and then I was discharged. discharged. What an amazing story. What an amazing, I mean, I, I stand in awe and amaze. As I understand this, you went nine days with a broken leg with bones out before you had really any medical right. attention whatsoever. I'm just, that's just, uh, that's just amazing. So in September of 45, when you were discharged, you came home to Mobile. Right. And th there's one other little thing I'd like to throw in. Um, I enrolled in Auburn under the GI Bill of Rights. And I came home for the Christmas holidays and was downtown, corner of Dolphin and Raw Street. And Dr. Stevens saw me and asked me how I was getting along. He had also, um, I, I didn't mention it, but he had also heard about me in New Guinea. The chaplains and the doctors were having lunch, and the chaplain was making a statement, talked about what happened to this boy from Mobile? And Dr. Stevens said, what's his name? And he told him. Well, Dr. Stevens had been the club physician for the old Mobile shippers, and I, I knew him from that. And he visited with me at one time, and then when I saw him on the corner of Dolphin and Royal Street, he asked me how I was doing, and I said I was having a little difficulty. He said, well, come on up to the office and let me look at it, which I did. And he x-rayed and said, that screw's got to come out. And he said, meet me at the Mobile Infirmary the day after Christmas, and I'll take it out. So I was there. And he put me on the operating table, took a regular screwdriver, I guess it was sterilized, and he took the screw out, and uh, I went on back to Auburn and went to the dispensary every day to have the wound tended to, and after about two weeks, a sliver of bone drained out. It was sort of looked like a button, and that's where the screw had gone in, and it had deteriorated around the screw. And when it drained out, the leg healed, and life has been good to me ever since. Mr. Sutton, you, you are indeed a a full-fledged member of the greatest generation in the world. And I, I, I'm glad this is on tape, that people from here on can see this and see in detail what you went through. And I was going to ask you what, what your war experience is, what effect it had on the rest of your life. After having gone through what you went through, it probably makes being an engineer a little... Uh, well... I was really never sorry yes. that I went into service. I wasn't sorry that I uh, got in the Air Force, which was much more dangerous than what they were, uh, had planned to put me in. 
I've never regretted. And uh, I would do it again. Oh, well. And uh, it's made me more conscious of death and how people suffer and how you depend on your, your friends because <clears throat> none of the bases I went to, I, I really knew, didn't know anybody. So you get to know them in a hurry. And all the people I associated with felt the same way that, that I did. Uh, we knew we had them uh, to fight the enemy. And although the armed forces did a good job, and maybe we are part of the greatest generation, but the people that built the ships and the airplanes and supplied the food and gave all the support. They're just as much a part of the greater oh, generation as the rest of us. On behalf of the American people, I want to thank you, sir, for, for what you have done and what you continue to do. Thank you. It's been my honor and my privilege to meet you today. And thank you so much. That's, this is the This is the first time that I've really told the story. Well, it's recorded for posterity now, so this is great. Yes, thank you so much. Um,